Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Room Now ACR 23 Daily Recap. It's the final day of ACR, and we have our final takes on what was important. I'm joined by The Room Now faculty who have been working like you can't imagine at this meeting. Um, and, then, you know, when I set, ask them to go out and cover the meeting, I say, have fun, learn something, teach something. And uh, interestingly, Janet and I are in San Diego, but uh, Morale and Richard are doing this virtually, and I think the virtual gig is a harder gig because they don't live stream everything, and you got to work even harder to get it. I'm joined by Richard Conway, who's in Dublin, Ireland. Morale El Marahi, who is in Van uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and, and Janet Pope, who's from London, Canada, and I'm Jack Cush. We're here in San Diego. I'm from Dallas. Let's get into it. We're going to do two rounds of what we thought was Great today, or since it's the last day, we can kind of pull whatever we want out of our hat and discuss what we thought was great and what the audience should know about. Um, I want to begin with uh, Dr. Conway. By the way, Dr. Conway is calling in from Galway, I'm sorry, from L Dublin, and I think it's O-Dark 30, 2 a.m. there, so he gets the Trooper Award of the evening. Richard, go ahead. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, no, I'm I'm good. I had a little nap, so I'll good to, to go. Um, so I'm going to talk about an abstract presented at the Late Breaker abstract, abstract session today, which is L16. Uh, this was by Lin Yi Peng and colleagues. It was on IgG4 related disease, a study done in China, 146 patients, and they took people with severe IgG4 related disease and the fact that they needed to be on an immunosuppressant and steroids. Um, they were in remission for 12 months at the time of entry to the study, and then they randomized them um, in an open-label fashion to continuing on both the steroids and the immunosuppressant, to stopping just the steroids and continuing on the immunosuppressant, or to stopping both, um, and saw what happened. This is an important clinical question, of course, because we are not really sure what to do uh, with IgG4-related disease patients who are in remission. Um, and what they found here was you stop both agents 52% flare in the next 18 months. You stop just the steroids, 14% flare, and you stop um, or you continue both 12% uh, flare. So I think really what this says is that like many diseases where um, there's an impetus to stop agents, it's a bad idea uh, to stop everything. You need to continue um, the immunosuppressions in these patients. Um, but it means it does say that we can probably stop the steroids. They don't need the combination treatment, um, but definitely need to to stay on something uh, for the majority of patients. I don't think fifty two percent flare rate is not acceptable uh, to me anyway. Certainly not. What were the immunosuppressants that they were using? A uh, combination of uh, different things. I th like I think in this part of the world, we'll generally use rituximab, but I think China maybe access issues. So there were oh, there yeah. were a number of different things going in there. Right, right. That was going to be my question, but yeah, I, I forgot. I mentioned uh, the fact that this is in uh, an area where they may not have access to um, rituximab, I think certainly does hamper them. And they really even more so have to worry about this. Um, does it, does this, do these data surprise you, uh, Janet? Uh, um, no, because uh, I think a better question would be instead of stopping, what if you taper down a little bit? So it doesn't surprise me that if they needed it, um, she didn't say how long they were in remission, but a lot of them had been at least in really good disease control for a year or more. So, you know, a patient would ask that, but I think a better question would have been, hey, what if I just lower it, cut the dose in half, go down by a bit? Will they do okay? Yeah. Um uh, Morale, do you see many IgG4 patients? Um, not as many currently. I would say I have maybe two or three in my practice. Um, so not as many, but I would say my experience echoes the sentiments in this is that, you know, you can't withdraw immunosuppressants entirely. But I certainly do agree that um, tapering the steroids is reasonable. And I agree with Janet that it would have been really nice to see what happens when you taper doses or frequency. And when you were at the Cleveland Clinic, were, were there a lot more of these patients? Um, yeah, I would say relatively I saw more when I was at the yeah. Cleveland Clinic. Yeah. yeah. I, I have to say, I've seen only one in my career. And I don't know if I'm just, um, if I'm missing them or I've, I know I've worked up quite a few. 
Um, but I don't see many of these patients. And I think that when you don't see many, it's hard, it's even harder to know what to do in the long term after you get control and put them in remission. And the question that I'll pose to all of you is, is this any different than any other disease we treat? Think of a bunch of diseases that we treat where we have this kind of belief that it may be self-limiting, like PMR, or um, I remember PAN and GPA being, that's probably self-limiting, and you probably stop therapy. Stills disease, reactive arthritis, can, I can go on and on and on. We have this great hope that many of our conditions that are sometimes lab labeled as self-limiting are never self-limiting. Um, so I'm ne never in a rush to, you know, get off of all therapies. I think that that's, um, I mean, patients love it when you say that kind of stuff, but it really is, I think, false hope. Richard, how do you handle this? Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. Um, I suppose there's different uh, shades of gray there, but uh, like the GCA especially, I mean, it does not go away. It's always there. I mean, PMOR can go away, but it's uh, always primed to come back and, and cause problems. And I suppose your comfort in stopping agents is going to depend on what's going to happen if the disease flares. So PMOR flaring and needing to go back on some steroids is not the end of the world. GCA flaring and you uh, going blind or having a stroke is not great. Uh, PAN, likewise, something uh, relatively disastrous could happen. I I'll ask uh, Morale and, and Janet, are there... Are there diseases and situations where you really do aim to get patients off of therapy after some point of being quiescent, morale? Um, maybe a, a burned out RA in a geriatric yeah. patient that's had it for 20, 30 years. Right. And I'm, I'm very convinced that there's nothing. Um, really, I, my inclination is more so to taper or to increase the interval of the dosing. Um, and then depending on how they do, uh, I would entertain in, a, in that kind of patient population just because of the risk benefits if there's nothing. Janet, what's your, what's your advice to your fellows on this whole issue of tapering right. and then withdrawal? Right. Well, for number one, if you stop drugs, they usually stop working. Number two, sometimes patients are smarter than us. So they're non-adherents. Uh, they often say, can I lower my dose? And that means they've already stopped it. And then kind of they have, but number three, we all have seen patients, but they're the minority. You kind of remember them that, um, you know, someone with lupus that was quite bad in 1980s and now they're great off treatment because they were a one and done real sick and then better. But we've seen a lot of patients where as they go downwards, um, they flare and we don't always recatch them on the same drug. So that's the problem. So I like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just leave it alone. Yeah. Um, before we move on, Richard was just talking about PMR. I got to interrupt this broadcast for old bulletin. And that is last month we did a campaign on PMR and, uh, Richard is a, is a PMR guy. And we had discussions, uh, he had him on, on two different webinars and Richard, I want you to tell the audience your plan for starting steroids, but more importantly for withdrawing steroids, because in a month of a lot of confusion and discussion and opinions, you know, you know, everyone kind of agrees what dose to start, but how to stop, and there's a lot of disagreement and, and it's a little bit like the art of rheumatology. I thought yours um, stood out in, um, in last month. So again, your plan for starting and weaning steroids with PMR. So I very much try and keep it simple because uh... I see patients getting constantly confused by our complicated steroid uh, tapers and mixing up their meds or the pharmacy mixing it up and the patient ending up on some sort of dose they're not meant to be on and uh, chaos ensuing. So I always pretty much start at 15 milligrams prednisolone uh, a day in PMR and I do it for a month. Um, and then I cut down every month by a dose of so 15 to 12.5 to 10 and then down by one milligram a month. I, I do it on a monthly basis because it's easier for the patient to remember. And in Ireland, at least, the pharmacy gives us a month's supply at a time. So provided the pharmacy do things correctly, the patient doesn't need to do anything. They just take their pills, um, go back the next month, get another set, take them, and uh, hopefully they end up on the dose they're meant to be on. Yeah, I throw that out there because I just think it's food for thought. I'm not looking for a big discussion on this because we discussed it all last month and we were running around the block with all kinds of opinions. So it's just for the audience to consider. Um, Morale, give us your um, big hit for the day. 
Yeah, I wanted to discuss slate breaking abstract number 19. So as we all know, the 2020 ACR guidelines strongly recommend intraarticular glucocorticoids injections for patients with NEOA, um, given that trials have demonstrated short-term efficacy in the knee. So, uh, you know, the question is, is there any sustained relief of an OA knee that's possible with an intraarticular injection? And so late-breaking abstract 19 looked at um, a drug called TLC-599 to answer this question, and it assessed the efficacy and safety of this drug in single or repeat doses. So what's TLC-599? It's a liposomal formulation of dexamethasone, sodium phosphate, that can be injected locally. So this study involved about 506 patients with Kellen grade 2 or 3 um, knee OA and had three different arms. So there was the TLC-599 arm, there was a dexamet dexamethasone sodium phosphate arm, and then there was a saline placebo injection arm. So the patients received injections at the study onset and at week 24. TLC-599 was superior to placebo and ADP and WOMAC pain and physical or pain and function after a single dose with the effects sustained until week 24. They also did do a second round of injections of TLC-599 at week 24 and provided, and this showed that it did provide further benefit until week 52. So for me, this was an exciting trial as it helps potentially expand our armamentarium for OA treatment and may be effective for year-long pain relief with two injections. Okay, that's that's really interesting. And um, Dr. Pope was the chair of the late breaking abstract session. And I know you had some thoughts and questions on this, Janet. What do you think? Right. So first of all, the comparison was dexamethasone and maybe because the other stuff is um, a dexamethasone kind of derivative. But the first thing is uh, the placebo was saline. So I asked if there were flares after and he said some, not many. So maybe they should have given them lidocaine. Who knows? The second thing was I thought it lasted longer than you would suspect. Third thing is, depends on what you ask. If you asked about Womac pain, the uh, dexamethasone injection or the a new study drug injection that has dexamethasone in it, we're not very different. But if you ask about average daily pain, the uh, drug under study looked to be a little bit uh, better. So I think there were, uh, I, you know, I think it's promising. It looks like you can uh, give it repeatedly. Um, but uh, I don't know. I think it's going to be a cost differential. And why wouldn't you just compare it to our triencinolone uh, acetonide or even a better drug, a triencinolone hexacetonide, and then really know where to put it? Yeah, the, I, I, I think that this allegiance to or how you do knee uh, specific, uh, steroid injections, when, how, what you use is is kind of like based on the family you were raised by and um and that's what you're married to and that's what you stick with and the science behind that is nil so um richard uh do you do steroid knee injections and what's your preferred agent yeah i, I do loads of them um I, I think one thing about this study and, and it's the same as all the the intraarticular steroid studies that really sort of the placebo response is enormous it dwarfs the response to the, the difference the delta between the drug and the placebo um so i do loads of uh knee injections i think aside from anything else you're harnessing that placebo effect uh to some extent um i mostly use uh depamedrone methylprednisolone um but yeah for no good reason just that's that's the way i was trained so that's what i use right and I got to tell you that um, I've become sort of anti-joint uh, injection. I know that's heretical amongst us rheumatologists. We have special skills delivered unto us from up high somewhere on how to do these injections that no one else can do. Uh, and we have special fingers or we have special ultrasounds and we can do this. And this is like, I don't know, it's it's your it's a badge of honor. Um, but the fact is, during COVID, we couldn't do any of this. Um, either you were not permitted or no one would want you to. And prior to COVID, I was uh, reporting on a lot of studies on joint injections. And you know what? There's no proof that they work beyond the acute period. Now, this study is interesting because it, it, morale points out a 26-week uh, or 24-week and a 52-week um, benefit. And that's impressive. I got to admit. But I, you know, I often say the first joint injection I give, long-lasting. 
You know, the ninth I give is about nine minutes that it's going to work. And then I worry about in this particular situation, the long lasting, which sounds like it's benefit, is it not? Maybe it's it's Achilles heel as far as what it's doing to cartilage, um, what it's doing to uh, other potential risks and whatnot. I think what I like about this kind of study is it's in the eye of the beholder. Either you're going to love it and run with it or you're or wait for it to come out or um, or maybe you're going to buck, buckle down like I am on, on my view. So, um, Janet, what's your big hit for today? So mine's also a late breaker L20. And I'm going to give you a background. So this is teletasicept. And sorry if I'm not saying it right. So what is it? It's a TASI um, FC fusion protein. And it's the bliss and April pathway dual inhibitor. So that kind of reminds us about belimumab and B-cell signaling. So the first question, it was an RA study is, wait, is it the wrong disease? So I will tell you, so this study was performed in China, but they did a phase three study in China that they reported in Milan last year in SLE. And I'll tell you in lupus, um, don't know if it's generalizable to my patients, but in lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, telly 160 milligrams compared to placebo. It was a sub-Q weekly for a year. The lupus trial last year that was presented gave um, SRI4, sort of double the amount of placebo. Um, the physician global improvement was about 85% versus placebo, 56%. It actually looked pretty darn good, even though we don't know the generalizability, the background treatment always on um, the lupus population. So this one went on to say, let's look in rheumatoid arthritis, large um, randomized controlled trial, double blind, methotrexate and adequate responders. I'll remind you, number one, the uh, often methotrexate, it only had to be 7.5 milligrams per week or more. In China, they tend to dose it less than the US. So I'm not sure what the mean dose was, but it was probably far lower than our contemporary FDA kind of trials because of a different population. The other thing is the ACR um, responses and the change in DOS were in general statistically significant, in general clinically relevant, but in general a little bit disappointing compared to what we think a drug coming to market would be like if we were looking at an IL-6 or a TNF or a JAK, we think an ACR uh, 20, 50, 70 of maybe about 60 or more for the ACR 20, ACR 50 is about 40% and ACR 70 about 15%. So their numbers were blunted. However, someone did ask uh, the presenter about it and she had a great response she said since we didn't have an active comparator it was methotrexate ir adding placebo or adding the the talitasacept drug um you don't know how would maybe an adalimumab arm have performed number one we don't know number two i was impressed that the x-ray changes looked very similar to me like trials that we would see that would be um uh, blunting the x-ray progression in a uh, fashion that is similar to other drugs I've seen. So I'm not fully impressed with the results is positive, but it does indeed look like a DMARD. And so in my mind, I thought maybe this is something to use in lupus, the RA lupus overlap patients, because that's why I presented the lupus stuff first. So lupus, um, in lupus, I'm quite impressed, but um, in order for FDA to ever approve it, you got to have a U.S. population uh, being studied. Moral, what do you think of this uh, this research? Yeah, I agree. I, I thought it's like the one thing that comes to mind to summarize it is ellipses, dot, dot, dot. I thought there's promise in it. I think that the target population for me, I would echo Janet's sentiments on that, would be a rupus patient. Um, but I'm excited to see more studies, especially in active comparator trial. Yeah. Um, Richard, would you put this in an RA patient? Yeah, I, I don't know what to, to make of the study. I keep going between thinking it's great and thinking it's not so good at all. Like you look at the ACR20 of 60%, you think that's actually decent enough. And then the ACR50 is is only 20%. Um, at the same time, the placebo ACR50 is a 5% or something. So it's, it's, it's very hard to know what to make of it. And I think they probably we probably do need a, an active comparator trial of some sort to know where to place this. Yeah, uh, my I, I just... I, I don't know why I just seem to see red flags and a drug like teletasicept has now appeared in the last few meetings uh, as being incredibly effective in, in lupus, um, in RA and in Sjogren's syndrome. And I don't know about you, but 
my treatment of lupus RA and Sjogren's is not very similar at all. And, uh, and I think the biology uh, and, and manifestations and, and range of what goes wrong there. Is, uh, so, uh, but you know, the good news is it's early and congratulations on your success. Now let's see what happens when you can put it into a lot of patients and hopefully do a multinational study. This is a similar to the results we had with the um, TLL018 combined JAK1 TIC2 inhibitor, also from China, where that that had this incredible results that we, that we reviewed back in ULAR. I don't. I think it might have been reviewed yesterday, but the you know the idea is that that combined JAK TIC inhibitor um, was as good as uh, tofacitinib, uh, and then in the two highest doses, blew tofacitinib out of the water. Um, I mean, crazy numbers, like 70% responses when tofacitinib was only getting 40%. Uh, and so, and there was no placebo. It was a act of comparative control. But they, these, these two, both these studies suffer from being done only in China uh, and producing incredible results. So again, they can make us, our skepticism go away with repeat data um, in, in a more diverse cohort. Um, my uh, Nick, uh, one I just want to briefly uh, mention is um, uh, an analysis of the Paisley study, looking at, uh, in this case, both um, the skin manifestations and response to Ducravacitinib, a TIC2 inhibitor, uh, and also the, relation, the relationship between um, uh, the alpha interferon signal and, uh, and drug response. So uh, Paisley was previously presented as a phase two um, and in this study, they do a sub-analysis of patients. Um, looks like it's about, I'm going to say, I don't know, 75, no, about 100 so, or so patients who had active skin disease. And, um, and as measured by the skin standard there, the CLASI score, which had to be 10 grading in. Uh, and, and really, they showed some very impressive um, skin responses. And I think that that's highly encouraging. In fact, when I'm advising companies who are developing drugs for lupus, I tell them big mistake to go after a global lupus response with an SL, a sleet eye going in and an SRI4 coming out. Um, often those trials exclude nephritis uh, and it may work. It usually has a high placebo response. And then you don't know who to use it to when it gets, if, if it gets approved. If you go after organ specific responses, like in this case, a skin only a lupus, a cutaneous lupus um, a clinical trial. It's brilliant. You know, we have plenty of cutaneous lupus to manage, whether it's DLE, SCLE, or, or acute LE. But anyway, they showed really good responses, 50% reduction in class at week 48, and somewhere between uh, roughly 50 and 71% of patients. Total clearing by classy score at week 48 was roughly uh, 20 to 30% on the three doses. That was all good. And then the other part that they let, it showed good pictures, which were impressive. Um, and the other part that they showed was that if you looked at um, SRI 4, 4 response by whether or not you were, had um, a high uh, alpha interferon signature versus low, um, you had better responses with the usual and indicated dose, 3 milligrams BID, in those who had a high alpha interferon response. And that's what they're purporting to be one of the mechanisms by which TIC2 and inhibition may work in lupus is it's going to ultimately affect um, the interferon um, signal. So uh, I think this is a, a nice, clean sub-analysis. Um, they have other trials in progress, but uh, we're going to have to wait for those. Anyone have a strong feeling about this? Look good. I liked it. Okay. Moral? Yeah, I was just, I can't remember if they... Uh showed you the subtypes of the cutaneous lupus and I'd, if they gave you a further analysis uh, as to what they, the response I, was. I, I want to say that there was a slide on that, but I think the numbers were too few to um, delve into uh, acute versus chronic LE, for instance. Okay. Um, so uh, I don't think that that was going to be their take-home message. Uh, I would hope that they're going to write this up and provide that kind of detail. Um Richard, are you using jack are you using jack inhibitors at all in lupus? I am um, not so much anymore. I, the, when the early baricitinib data was there and looked good, um, 
I I went through a phase of using them, and then the the phase three data or the later data did not look so good, so I kind of stopped a bit. I've become very pessimistic about drugs for lupus, and that we see all, we see these excellent early data for lots of agents, and then it just doesn't seem to work out when they get onto the the later study. So I'm I suppose we'll be cautiously slightly optimistic, but uh, not fully convinced yet. Yeah, the pattern is you're, everybody's a hero in phase two and a bum in phase by the time they get to phase three. But think of the, all the literature has come out since we've seen JAK inhibitors since 2012. And there is a steady stream of cutaneous success with the JAK inhibitors, whether it's, you know, I'll say GVHD, that's much more than skin, but, um, but you know, dermatomyositis and you know, all the, all, all, you know, atopic dermatitis and the alopecia variants and, and there's, and there's more to come. I mean, it's pretty and vitiligo. Um, it's pretty impressive. Uh, and oh, so much so that I'd say that's the home run if you're developing a jack inhibitor in, in, in lupus. But um, right now, as best I know, there's only one company um, that's out there that is working on a jack inhibitor for dermatomyositis. So we'll see where that goes. All right, our next round, we're going to do shorter presentations. Let's begin with uh, Morale um, and see what you got. All right, I really like Sleep Breaking Abstract 18 because it may help guide treatment of primary Sjogren's syndrome through molecular classification of salivary glands. This study entailed transcriptomic profiling of salivary glands in a Chinese cohort, and it did discover three distinct subtypes. First subtype is a posse immune or C1 subtype. The second subtype was a cold immune or C2 subtype. And the third subtype was a hot immune or C3 subtype. So it showed that the cold immune subtype involved activation of the classical adaptive immune system, and it showed depressed metabolism, whereas the hot immune subtype involved activation of the innate immune system and had active metabolism. They did also show that the cold immune subtype had a higher risk of lymphoma. So overall, I think this molecular classification of salivary glands helps guide understanding and the heterogeneity of the disease and can help guide further treatment. I would like to see studies hopefully maybe incorporate this and maybe we would see more positive studies for Sjogren's treatment. It certainly is a smart approach. How many people did they look at overall in this uh, as far as their lip biopsies? Um, let me see if I have that. So 396 had primary Sjogren's syndrome. So total, I think of about, if I do the math really quickly, about 500, 398 had primary Sjogren's syndrome, 87 were non-primary Sjogren's syndrome, and 44 were early primary Sjogren's syndrome. And they all had lip biopsies? Yeah. Wow. Impressive. That's... I know that might not, that might not be as common here, but... That's an Academy Award-winning uh, abstract uh, uh, as far as effort um, and histology and making correlations. And I think that that should be applauded. Um, and I'm often not applauding Sjogren's research because it's 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 admired in so many things. But this makes something confusing into something that's quite clear. Janet, what did you think? You were there. Um, what's cool is I think AI will help this in future. And you'd want to know on these subtypes, my guess is they'll have different responsivity to drugs, but it might not be to specific drugs. It could be to all drugs. The way the, in a way, the fibrotic phenotype and RA um, on synovial biopsy is myelofibrotic is not a very good response. They're, they're right. kind of a bit, they're probably that um, ceiling effect that we never get, uh, you know, everybody in an ACR20. So I kind of wonder if may, I would guess the cold one, but I kind of wonder if um, one of those sets is going to be um, possibly a non-informative patient and for drug development. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, where all the futility will be met and none of the uh, responsiveness. Um, do Richard, do you get um, lip biopsies in Sjogren's? I do not. Uh, not not as a rule. I I I zero negative Sjogren's and uh, I I will occasionally do it. It's hard to get it here. A high complication rate. A lot of paresthesia posted, which can sometimes be worse than the symptoms you were doing it for in the first place. Um, so, so rarely, but uh, I do occasionally. Okay. All right. Um, Janet, you have a a second one for us. 
I do. I have two really quick ones because in my mind, they're a pair. They weren't related. Um, they weren't presented together, but it's the clinical question here in systemic sclerosis is who will get ILD and who will progress ILD? Because I think every clinician wants to know that that's treating these patients. So abstract 1700, it was an oral. It was looking at the big U star. That's the big, large conglomeration of multiple countries contributing um, scleroderma um, to the database. So there were over 5,000 patients. And what it showed was that if, if you had a negative HRCT at baseline, um, over time, who will get ILD? And it's almost like a flat line of incidence over time. There's a little bit of variability, but the idea was always the old fashioned clinical wisdom is that if you don't get it in your first uh, couple of years, you're probably home free and the incidence goes way down. This is showing not the incidence in the first uh, year or two, because if you already had a positive HRCT, you're out. But if you didn't, you can get it anywhere along the way. And they went up to 10 years. And the risk factors were the ones we know, men more than women, um, topoisomerase one positive, more than um, anti-centromere or RNA polymerase three, a little bit of elevated uh, CRP, and probably age as well, although age was hard to know. And then obviously dyspnea. Well, dyspnea is related to getting ILD, not a risk factor for ILD. So that was the first one. The second one was another question, okay, who's going to progress? If I have patients um, in my scleroderma clinic and they have um, ILD, who's going to progress? So in this one here, I'm going to try to find the number. Sorry about that. The number, um, I'll find it in a sec. But this one was looking at two large databases combined from two sites in Europe. And it was um, number 643. And what they asked was... Um, if you have progressed enough that would have gotten you into a randomized control trial, such as progressive pulmonary, pulmonary fibrosis, the um, census and in build trials for Nintendinib, um, the other, uh, there's many ILD trials. So they looked at the inclusion criteria. So if you were a progressor now looking over the last year, what was your chance of progressing in the next one to two years? And guess what? No prediction at all. Um, people who didn't progress before then progress. People who did progress didn't all over the map. And in fact, it was almost protective next year about progressing if you progress this year. So it's kind of, um, I think we have to beware. I know. So in other words, um, trial design has said, you know, put in only early diffuse with lung disease. So the one abstract kind of negates that. Then they also have put in people enriching the cohort for people with ILD already progressing, and they don't all. However, think of it in RA. If we have an RA RCT um, and people have active disease coming in, even a high CRP in some of these uh, trial requirements, um, only um, 8 to 15% actually get erosions in the next year. Maybe that's the very same with lupus progression because these are true progression. Um, the, and the stricter the definition, the smaller the end. So anywhere from 19 to 30% approximately progressed over the next one to two years by progression criteria. So I think we have to beware as a clinician, know that ILD can occur, ask about symptoms, auscultate, periodically for sure do PFTs and do an HRCT where indicated, number one. And number two, once you progress and we treat, um, they might level. It's, I always say it's like an escalator. It's not an elevator going straight down or a ramp. You progress or you, you're level, then you maybe aspirate or get COVID or something, get an infection. You progress, then you level, then you progress. So within an individual, it's not a slope. It's a series of line, stop, line, stop. And we have to remember that. So it's important for the clinicians. Yeah, so let's... That's uh, that's uh, instructive in that disease management becomes key. Advice becomes key. One of my favorite lines to patients is, the goal is to be boring. Find that which works in a treatment regimen, a lifestyle, um, a follow-up, a lab thing. Be boring. And the more boring you are, the more you're going to stay on that ramp that's not changing. And you're not falling off, as you're describing here, by life's events. Some of that's going to be, unavo you know, unavoidable, but um, that's instructive in a cohort that's really difficult to um, to manage uh, longitudinally, especially so. Uh, Richard, your um, quick hit. 
So my one was a study by Peter Peter, Peter Taylor presented today, 2586. Um, this was a new blood-based uh, test in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we're using plasma and looking at cell-free DNA and that was synovial mapped. It always sounded a bit complicated and maybe a bit expensive, uh, but the results um, were very impressive. So we, we know seropositive RA, we, we have tests for that, so that's uh, fine. What was really interesting here was seronegative RA. Um, so this test had a sensitivity of 84% and a specificity of 95% for seronegative RA. Um, and I think that potentially is incredibly useful to us clinically. Give me those numbers again. So a sensitivity of 84% and a specificity of 95%. And what is the test against? Or is it one antigen or peptide, or is it a series? I, I, of it's not one as far as I understood it. it it's, so it's looking at this cell-free DNA and synovial mapping signatures and then using machine learning with the results to, to spew out this number. This isn't but, the joint ID study, is it? The which? He didn't, he didn't call these joint IDs? No, no, I don't think so. Okay, there was another abstract at the meeting about developing an autoantibody, looking for autoantibodies against joint peptides, and that finding certain joint peptides could be predictive of future remission. I, I, I played with that a long time, looked at all the time, but in the end, I don't think that it had enough punch uh, of predictive value. What you're talking about has tremendous predictive value in in a. Um, uh, a troublesome group that 20, 30% of patients you follow who are seronegative and who are they really? Um, uh, this seems like it might unify some of those people. That's interesting. Very interesting. Um, any... I, I was just going to say, I could say where it would fit in is once you fail first and second line advanced therapies, you know, if they're a PSA without psoriasis, maybe they'll get an IL-17 or something. If they're RA and seronegative, maybe a test like this, you'd say, okay, I'm going to go on to a different uh, drug that's in an RA sphere. Who knows, right? Right. That would be the next step, right? To see um, if he can find a lot. If he can find a large cohort of people taking many different medicines and responders and non-responders, then come up with some strategy as to what you wouldn't want to use and what you might want to use. Um, boy, that would really help a lot of us people who are taking care of these folks as, as Dr. Taylor and others are. So that's, that's very cool. Um, my last one is um, a, a abstract oh, 2480. It looks like from uh Consit at all Victoria Consit uh, who's with uh the Vienna group, um, Smolin and uh, Ali Taha is the senior author on this. And um, they uh, took two different data sets, one, the Nord DMAR data set and um, tested, uh, developed criteria for flare on 80% of those patients. And we're going to then um, validate it in the other 20% and then also validate it in the Vienna RA cohort, which is almost 2,600 patients. Um, and in there, in the uh, Nord um, DMART uh, study, they asked patients, um, uh, how are you today on a five-point scale? I am much worse, worse, unchanged, better, much better. And a flare was said to be a two-class uh, change in status. And then they backworked their numbers and came up with a, uh, a cut point for what constituted a flare on CDI, which was 4.7, and on, I'm sorry, SDI, it was 4.7, and on CDI, it was 4.5. Um, and they made other correlations, which were important and looked good, and they showed that that patients who met this criteria were also shown to have functional um, uh, consequences to such a flare and even radiographic consequences to such a flare. Um, so it's a kind of metric PRO correlate kind of study, not my cup of tea, but you know what? They really put a number on flares. And I think I, I it's this is one of my pet peeves in rheumatology, especially in RA. We all treat flares and you know how it goes. It's a note from the patient, a call from the patient, and you write a prescription for prednisone. 
or they come in and they get an IM injection, or they get some new dexamethasone intraarticular thing that's going to last for nine months, you know, you hope. But it's all steroids all the time. And that's that, that's the cha-cha-cha dance that you do. Uh, and there's no science to it. And there's no rationale to it. And it's got built-in toxicity. And why can't we use, you know, in, I don't know, a type B2 patient, I just made that up, colchicine, or in a type E E9 patient, you know, a short course of anakinra, or, you know, let get some company to do some clinical trials in uh, patients with RA who are flaring and use your active comparator gold standard as steroids. You've got a built-in toxicity index that you got to win at no matter what you're doing, right? Um, and I would think, I don't know, I can't say that's a certainty, but it certainly makes sense. So I think it's an advance. I think it's an advance to People developing therapies, I think it's an advance to people who want to study this issue, as I hope many do. Um, anybody have a magical formula for flare management? I think it's what you said. And I mean, in the catch cohort, we validated the flare, um, the ULAR flare questionnaire or index. And Half of the patient's flares we think aren't, number one. And number two, when it's a very major flare, there's a lot more concordance, of course. Because when they feel badly and we don't see anything, we tend not to believe them. And then we might change their treatment. But if you're doing it on the phone, you just say, okay, well, we'll phone in the, the prednisone. And we usually ask, well, they're flaring about adherence. Are you even right. taking the drugs, right? Because right. it's hard to be, you know, it's it's a bit of a ball and chain. It's hard to always be 100% adherent. You know, gray hair allows me to tell a story um, that's we hope is real. And that is when I was a resident, I went and did a, a extended rheumatology rotation at the University of Pittsburgh with uh, Gerald Rodden and Tom Metzger, who are heroes of mine. Um, no nicer man in the world than Dr. Thomas Metzger. And um, and I when I would did rounds with them, they had an inpatient unit, a rheumatology inpatient unit, and they would admit patients with active disease and flares. And know what their treatment was? Bed rest. That's it. Bed rest and analgesics. They didn't want to give steroids to them. They sometimes had to give steroids to them. But if they just put them on total bed rest, and that means bedpan bed rest, um, no walking, no talking, no having fun, um, you know what? Their sed rates and CRPs came down. Their swollen joints got better. And, and I just say this because it doesn't have to be just steroids. And again, I think that this research allows um, for or this, this, these, these findings and, and these new cutoffs allow for further research going forward. All right, that's enough for our final recap of ACR 23. I want to thank uh, Drs. Conway, Pope, and El Ramahi for this great discussion. Uh, tune in and follow our topic podcast, which will be coming up very soon. You'll get a topic uh, um, recant of what was hot in areas like lupus, RA, spinal arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and JAK inhibitors in the days to come on Room Now. Thanks very much, everyone. Happy ACR.